this is far left extremism and there's plenty of it about because they you know they're the ones in the art galleries attempting to destroy priceless works of art they're the ones who are blocking ambulances blocking bridges uh, causing actual uh, m tangible economic harms to the country coming up on british thought leaders pete north talks about extremism the real far right in this country is Islamic extremism. Twitter's Northern Variant discusses immigration and politics. This is a government that has totally ignored the message of the referendum, which was to reduce immigration and brought an extra million people in. How is that not an extreme policy? That's extreme defiance of the majority of people. So uh, who were, who's the extremists here? and what the abandoning of small-c conservatism means for British voters. We've seen an obliteration of conservatism in this country. And so if someone who's centre-right like me wants centre-right policies, I simply, you know, I'm going to go to the ballot box at the next election. I've got no options. Welcome to British Thought Leaders, I'm Lee Hall. Today I'm sitting down with Pete North, writer and commentator. Pete, thanks for joining us. Hello. So, I mean, you're behind the uh, Twitter or X account, Northern Variant, which is uh, quite One popular. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, you, you started that account after your personal account was banned. Yes. I mean, can you talk us through a bit of the, the censorship you've experienced? Uh, uh, well, um, if, if you're a, a sort of right-leaning blogger or Twitterer, uh, there's certain topics that are off limits on most social media platforms and uh, X Twitter has one of the most aggressive uh, censorship regimes going full stop and it's one that's weighted so that um, lefty activists if they take offense at what you say they can just hit the report button and it'll go through to some auto algorithm um, it's so ridiculous uh, I was out um, we were taking a little Cessna out for a fly um, up in Yorkshire and there was this um, uh, little biplane, I forget what it was, but it had a swastika on the tail. It was a sort of wartime trainer, Booker Youngman, I think it was. And um, I posted the, the, the photo of it and I actually got a 12 hour ban suspension because it's auto bot recognized the swastika and said, I am posting hateful conduct. And these things mount up with every little complaint, these sort of mob reports. And then eventually they'll just, you wake up one morning, go onto Twitter, your account's been zapped. So I think I'm on, well, there was my EU referendum one, Leave Alliance one, the Peak North one, uh, and I've got a couple of uh, spare accounts. So, you know, you've always, it doesn't matter how, how big you're growing, you always have to be thinking about what's your plan B. Um, because the things that are allowed, you know, porn bots are allowed, naked anti-Semitism is allowed, Islamism alla is allowed, but uh, being a white male conservative, uh, posting fairly pedestrian views about immigration or the trans agenda or anything else, you will get the hate mobs coming on and shutting you down. So uh, I, I kind of think of it more uh, of a, an online asymmetric warfare where now when, once they zap my account, I go under for a little bit, keep it quiet and then pop up as something else. Uh, you, they, they can't, they can, they can stop me eventually with algorithms that can detect my uh, posting style, but the, you can't, you can't censor the message because uh, what I say is not actually that uh, controversial as such. Um, a lot of what I'm saying, um, much the same is said in the books of uh, Melanie Phillips and Douglas Murray. Uh, there's, I actually heard Douglas Murray on the radio the other day. There's not a lot of difference between us. I think the main difference is just a matter of style. He's clearly got the, uh, the accent and the social status. I'm Joe Nobody with my Twitter account. And um, I, 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 I'm a straight talker. I don't, I don't, I'm not one for florid pros and I, I respect my audience to see that if I talk about, uh, it, it, you know, if I talk in generalities, I'm not referring to all people of that faith, colour or creed or whatever, uh, but there's always people, you know, vultures sitting on the sidelines with tiny little accounts who they consider it a good day's work if they manage to uh, get somebody banned. So 
that's that's the environment you work with that's that's what i've accepted um so it's difficult to grow a brand as it were uh, so i'm considering um starting up a sub stack uh, where i can post my long forms because because uh elon musk wants to turn um to turn it into a rival to the mainstream media and uh, I, I could I, I could see what he was trying to do and I respect what he's trying to do um, but you can't do that if you're going to punish your most prolific writers uh, you know until a couple of weeks ago I was producing two or three long form articles a day and when you tot it up when I'm on a roll um, it's about a similar amount of output to the entire team of Daily Telegraph uh, opinion writers. And I think I'm actually better at it. So that he was getting this content for next to nothing because um, I, I was getting a little bit of ad revenue, £50 a month, which is yeah, it's better than nothing uh, for my little side hustle. It pays for my uh, airfix model habit. So, uh, um, but, you know, uh, if he's going to punish his content creators, uh, you know, there's actually no point for someone like me to go on build an audience and then just have it zapped on the whim of some algorithm or a lefty activist so you know my relationship with uh, x has soured considerably because it's still a censorship platform on the topic of censorship we've seen this guy get the two years for the um stickers yeah, recently. some milia isn't it yeah uh, well, he's he's with uh, a, a group called Patriotic Alternative, and they they are pretty much you know a lot of people when they say when they're accused of being far right, they'll say I'm not far right. Hang on, um, well you know Patriotic Alternative, no question about it, is a far right, and it, it mirrors a lot of the um, they take a lot of their uh, content and marketing strategy off uh, the far right on the continent. It's a sort of spin off from, I believe it was Generation Identity, but for a while, you know, uh, people talk about far right in Britain. Uh, it, generally, it consists of um, you know a few few dozen uh, bloggers and a few activists, and uh, there's only. In terms of actual hardcore neo-Nazis, there are vanishingly few of them. Uh, they're mostly based up in the Pennines in the sort of Royston Vasey end of things, and most of their income supports the local games workshop. So it's 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 not it's not a huge movement, uh, and that's that's the weirdness about this because you've seen the full weight of the establishment fall on this one guy, putting him in prison, on uh, uh, you know for production of. Discurs with the intent to distribute. So this is, uh, you know, it's someone else might actually put the sticker and commit what is essentially uh, loosely described as criminal damage, but uh, he, he, they've made him uh, the example. And I think that's quite a dark and dangerous road to go down, even if you fundamentally disagree with what Sam says, which I do. Uh, he, he's, his view, I think, you know, uh, as a start of a 10, we should be deporting the people with no right to be here. But at that end, they're talking about anyone with brown skin, anyone remotely foreign, even sort of second, third generation needs to be, needs to have their passports ripped out and immediately deported. Uh, so that's certainly not where I'm at. But, um, you know, uh, the, these, are, these are debates we've got to have. You cannot stifle these debates forever. And, uh, and, and the disparity, of course, is we've got this, you know, we've got mobs of far left activists uh, outside parliament making their demands. We've got far left activists and Islamists chasing female MPs down the street. I think I've seen four or five examples in the last few weeks. And these are the same politicians, incidentally, uh, you know, uh, who's the shadow chancellor lady? Rachel Reeves, you know, her best pal was Joe Cox, and she's the first to invoke her name. Uh, and yet, you know, the, somehow, in the space of a fortnight, it's all got derailed, so we're talking about Islamophobia, when it's far, the far left, uh, you, you know, people are saying, oh, it's Islamism, uh, and of course, Islamism is a huge issue. But when you look at these mobs, uh, at least 50% of them are a particular type, 
of white middle class uh, lefty liberal uh, on the far left sympathies for Jeremy Corbyn eco extremism usually remainer to the core um, and so you know this is this is far left extremism and there's plenty of it about because they you know they're the ones in the art galleries attempting to destroy priceless works of art they're the ones who are blocking ambulances, blocking bridges, uh, causing actual uh, m tangible economic harms to the country. And the eco-extremism that permeates into energy policy has caused no end of damage. And so to talk about this phantom far-right threat, um, it's pure misdirection. And, uh, and what we're seeing is this, um, this beefing up, uh, the sexing up of the far right threat as a counterbalance. So they say, ah, but what about all these horrible far right people in, when we've got this elephant in the room of an absolutely unhinged, it's, it's, it's a manifestation of what I believe to be um, middle class entitlement. Uh, that's what the far left is now because these are the people, you know, even before Brexit, they were out the following day, the day after the general election, protesting the result of the general election, protesting the result of the referendum, uh, trying to overturn uh, the, uh, the, the, the result of the referendum. Um, these are tyrants who are absolutely used to getting absolutely everything their own way all the time and on issue after issue after issue the 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 Tory government just caves in and lets them have their way and that's that's what they're used to they've got power and they and because they've been indulged so often they're getting bolder and their demands are becoming more extreme all the time and I, I it's precisely because the Tories have uh, are, are running scared all the time and uh, rolls over uh, that nobody's interested in voting them for this time around. You know, they were elected uh, uh, on the assumption that they would be a robustly right-wing government that would actually do something useful with Brexit, would bring down immigration, would, you know, overhaul the civil service. Uh, this is what a lot of people thought they were getting out of Boris Johnson. They were fools to trust him, of course. Um, but uh, what did we get instead? We got um, two years of uh, dithering and procrastination of uh, COVID um, and a retreat from anything remotely conservative ever since. So. Looking at those people some more, it's kind of a, a, a cultural elite, really. Yes. And they, know, yeah. they know what they're fighting against, but it seems they're very misinformed, or at least not very well informed on what they're fighting for, whether it's green issues in the Yeah, Middle they're East. totally reactionary, completely driven by emotion. Facts don't come into it. So well, Their disdain as well for fellow Brits is, yeah, is quite Yeah, this is mad. a class war. Make no mistake. This is uh, the, 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 the middle class, uh, the, you know, it's a particular set, and they were absolutely outraged that we had a referendum in the first place. They don't believe that the ordinary person is qualified to comment on a major constitutional issue such as the European Union. And so they were outraged that we got a say, outraged that we got a vote, even more outraged that we won, and especially outraged that that referendum was actually carried out. So... Uh, this this is the this is the depth of the entitlement, and it's purely um, a, a, a narcissistic projection of what it means to be a good person, to be anti-racist, to be pro-net zero, to be. Uh, it, it's it's the ultimate virtue signalling, and it's pure political vanity. And uh, yeah, the the, the, more, uh, the more you know, they're, they're absolutely unhinged to the point where they call the Tories a far-right party, when this has just been the limpest, lamest, uh, lame-duck conservative administration of all time that's done absolutely nothing with power, done absolutely nothing with Brexit, and somehow uh, it, it is considered far-right, even though it's allowed a further million extra people in uh, since they were elected on a, a ticket of reducing immigration. Mm. Uh, do you see this as damage done by liberalism? If we look at our religion, if we look at our institutions, if we look at education, if we look yes. at the family, uh, none of them have really stood up to the effects of liberalism. 
Uh, correct. Um, it, it's you know everyone can see it. The uh, thing is, we uh, it was I think it's pretty much my generation. You know, everyone everyone blames the '60s hippies, but you know, my parents, they, uh, uh, certainly my mother, she still went to church. Um, uh, but it's my generation that sort of said, you know, we're not doing this anymore. Sundays are boring. We don't want to go and sit in some boring cold church and listen to some irrelevant old guy lecturing us about Jesus. We don't want to spend our Sunday evenings watching Antiques Roadshow and, um, and you know, uh, uh, this, is the, this is the culture we've created. And the thing is, once you, once you take something like Christianity out of the mix uh, as the sort of moral conscience of the nation, uh, you, you, it's the great. It creates this uh, moral vacuum, and all these other terrible ideas have just poured in, and so that's where the threat from Islamism comes from, um, environmentalism. The, these are all belief systems that are filling the void created by the British rejection of, uh, you know, basically a thousand years of uh, Christian tradition. So, uh, you know, um, uh, where to blame? We've done it to ourselves. We're the ones who threw all our traditions on the bonfire and, and look at what we've got left you know so this is uh, this is the world we live in now. So Peter Hitchens went kind of full Denethor said you know flee the British Isles yeah. there's nothing here for the young people. But Would where you agree? to? Well, where yeah. to? <laughs> you know name one western country that isn't suffering from the exact same intellectual and moral decline. Canada uh, I think they might. They, it's looking like they might be coming out the, the other side of it because there's a there's a conservative movement growing, um, but uh, you, you know Europe's a mess. Um, and even if it wasn't politically in a mess, it's economically in a mess because of their uh, their green energy policies, net zero, and the the latest reforms to the common agriculture policy, which has made it effectively a net zero funding mechanism. Um, so it's driving up the price of food, driving up the cost of energy. Uh, it's destroying the chemical industry. It's destroying the car industry, and soon they're uh, you know they're putting up this carbon border uh, border tax adjustment mechanism. It's called, and that's to keep out. Um, Chinese EVs and anything else that's made in China or India. So we're getting more protectionist while destroying our own industries and making imports more expensive. Europe is crippled. Uh, you know, it's uh, America has turned in on itself and has become more protectionist. Um, so, you know, Arguably, the uh, is it the Inflation Reduction Act? There's there's measures to reshore jobs to the U.S. That's a response to Trump winning in 2016. It might be Biden's thing, but America is turning protectionist and it's withdrawing its interest from the world. So you know, America could be on the turn, but. America is a deeply fragmented country, and whatever it's you know it's it, it's the inverse of Europe, where it depend even though its uh, economy could be on the on the upswing, um, the culture is getting more toxic and more dangerous all the time. And you know there, it, it, it's it's. It's doubtful whether the USA, as we know it, can survive another 50 years if the divisions keep going the way they are. So, uh, you know, uh, where, where would you go if you're going to leave? Uh, I, I jokingly argue that um, maybe it's time for Brits to uproot, uh, uh, to up sticks and uh, go and uh, colonise Argentina and start again because they seem to have the right approach because it gets to a certain point with state corruption. I was always against this sort of libertarian idea of let's go in and just start deregulating en masse and cutting each department and yada, yada, yada. Uh, you've got to do it carefully, slowly with a scalpel and reform over a number of years. Uh, but there just gets to a point where the bureaucracy and corruption is just so deeply entrenched that I think you start have, having to think about more drastic measures, just taking whole departments, defunding them, scrapping them, starting again, letting them build up from... And we see it in this country, because I think there's, uh, they're trying to build a tunnel under the Thames, um, and it's taken years and years and years and millions and millions and millions to produce nothing. Uh, it's not even a shovel-ready project, as I understand it, uh, but it's all the regulatory compliance, all the green and eco assessments and um, 
that's true of any infrastructure, anything we attempt to do. And then you've got your NIMBYs who can stop things. You've got your um, <clears throat> green pieces and friends of the earth who will take the government to court saying, no, you can't expand this runway. No, you can't build that airport. No, you can't um, build this power station. So gradually as our existing infrastructure is crumbling, collapsing and reaching retirement age, we're a state where plenty of money is going into infrastructure projects, but none of it is actually delivering infrastructure. And this, this is this is how this is how this country just gradually crumbles into third world status. Well, let's go back and, and talk a bit about what we were on before. So, and the prime minister did his speech recently talking about extremism, and he kind of equated uh, Islamism and the far right as these are the two things we need to worry about. From what I understand of what the, the counter-terrorist police are, are working on, it's pretty much 80% of it is, is Islamic extremism. So uh, yeah. why do you think the Prime Minister framed it in that way of putting the two? Well, he's, he's attempting to manufacture a centre ground. When he was speaking uh, from the podium, he, he was talking to all of us who are in the centre, not these horrible people on the far left and the Islamists and not these horrible far right, the, the, the normal rational centre. Uh, but this far right as such doesn't exist and is not nearly as much of a threat as the far left. And uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a calculated uh, shifting of the goalposts. But what we've actually seen, the real far right in this country is Islamic extremism. Because, you, you know, the, it's the horseshoe theory that uh, political uh, extremes meet in the middle. Um, you know, they're anti-gay, um, anti-Jewish, you know, the, the, the things that ex Muslim extremists and the far right believe in, they're, they're, there's quite a lot of crossover. Uh, so the real far right in this country is the, um, is the Islamist threat in this country. And it's joined forces with the far left. And so it's actually us who are uh, dubbed far right we're the majority now, the people who believe that immigration should be controlled, that people with no right to be here should be deported, uh, that we should be able to freely discuss these issues online, that uh, men cannot change sex. These are ordinary, everyday, normal opinions that have been castigated as beyond the pale by a media class. But actually, you know, my opinions often get called far right I'm, I'm to the right of the centre right, but my views are pretty pedestrian and no different to what you would hear in the average pub in Bradford, Leeds, York, across the north, or anywhere in this country, because it's, it's the norm. So um, uh, this phantom centre, uh, you know, as much as the far right has been invented, this centrism is, uh, that, that uh, Sunak's talking about, about uh, and talking to is another fabrication that doesn't exist because um, it's the majority that reject all of the left-wing extremism that's um, <clears throat> it's actually now deeply embedded uh, in the sort of centrist consensus in Parliament. Uh, they don't see themselves as extremists, but these are the people who on an ideological basis went and blew up our power stations, our, our coal stations. Um, they've, uh, they've taxed uh, gas to make energy more expensive, which makes manufacturing more difficult, which makes exporting uh, less competitive. They are damaging our economy every day because they have subscribed to these uh, far left environmentalist extreme ideas. Um, so. Um, and, and again, you know, this is a government that has totally ignored the message of the referendum, which was to reduce immigration and brought an extra million people in. How is that not an extreme policy? That's extreme defiance of the majority of people. So uh, who are, who's the extremists here? Uh, is it me who, who thinks, you know, uh, we need to get this down to a trickle because we need all these people who've come here, um, they need time to assimilate, to integrate and to learn our customs and we need time to adjust to them. But if you've got this constant churn, this constant transient uh, culture in our city suburbs, there, there is no overarching culture and you get to the point where everything's stressed, the roads are stressed, the railways are stressed, 
everything, you know, the, the national grid is creaking. We're running out of clean water because we haven't built enough reservoirs. Um, <clears throat> we simply do not have the capacity to keep taking millions of people. So something has got to stop and something has got to change very rapidly, but they're not listening. Um, and is it because, is it out of malice or out of stupidity or sheer incompetence or a combination of all three? But they are the extremists. And so it's, it, it's very much uh, a, def a, a deflection. Uh, always accuse your opponent of what you yourself are guilty of. It's uh, Saul Alinsky sort, sort of stuff. So. I mean, this phrase far right seems to have kind of been weaponized now and to describe the people who are centrists, the people who are small c conservatives. Mm. I mean, who's behind that and what's the end game, do you think? Uh, well, I mean, this has been, this is not a new dynamic, this, the, the, for my entire adult life, this, uh, the, 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 the weaponization of, uh, of anyone remotely conservative uh, as being far right. It's, it's as old as the hills. So it's, uh, it, it's, it kind of starts with the old stodgy conservatism that was against gay marriage. That um, that was uh, against immigration and all the old classic establishment conservatism. Uh, they used to be beaten with that stick themselves, and so the Tory Party uh, they spoke to marketing consultants and said, "We need to detoxify the brand," and um, by that they meant you need to abandon conservatism. So over the last. <coughs> 25 years or so we've seen the establishment conservative party much like the church of england and the monarchy gradually abandoning all the constitutionally important stuff uh, right through to social values moving further and further to the center and even even quite left wing on some things now uh, so we've seen an obliteration of conservatism in this country and so if someone who's centre-right like me wants centre-right policies, I simply, you know, I'm going to go to the ballot box at the next election. I've got no options. Uh, so uh, if it, it's going to create the very far right that people fear, um, that the establishment fears, because if that's, if that's the closest I can get to centre-right, then that's where the X on my ballot box is, is going to go. Uh, I might not agree with these uh, far-right parties, but as a protest, if you've given me nowhere, to, nowhere else to go, that, that's where my X is going to go. We have the election coming this year. From looking at the, the by-elections, it feels like it could be quite eventful. What are your thoughts on the, the political situation in Britain? Then? Uh, it, hopeless, um, because... The it looks like the Labour Party, if the polls are to be believed, I think it's going to be a lot closer than people think, because we've still got a general election campaign to go through, in which Labour reminds us all how dreadful they are. They've spent the last three weeks, three or four weeks, doing that, and people are going to be asking, has the Labour Party really changed? Uh, well, not really. There's sti it's still got an, uh, a major problem with anti-Semitism. It still panders to Muslim extremists. It still panders to the woke extremists, the, uh, uh, the gender lunatics. Um, so it, in, not in any way is the Labour Party electable, but it's going to win by an accident of numbers. And not because anybody, everyone recognises the Tories have got to go because they're underperforming. So the Tory voters are just going to stay at home. Some might peel off and vote for reform and a few of the other fragmented parties on the right. Um, but generally there's going to be, uh, I think there's going to be a reduced turnout and a, a, an overall lack of enthusiasm. And I think uh, Labour are going to start losing to outfits like Galloway and the Green Party. And um, so that they're going to lose maybe a few key university cities where the Green Party has activism, uh, the so-called UKIP effect, where they might not win the seat, but it's enough to uh, topple the incumbent. So, uh, yeah, some of these things could be a lot closer run, but uh, what's clear is the next election is not going to resolve anything. Uh, there's there's this feeling of it's not apathy it's rage and disaffection and so the the whoever's in next will not have a popular mandate will not have the traditional honeymoon period 
and within weeks of winning the election will be in a state of civil war because a fractious coalition like Labour, much the same as the Tories, it cannot stay united, cannot put, um, it, you know, the knives will be out for Starmer almost out straight out of the gate. So we're in for a torrid five or ten years of politics because Labour gets in, nobody wants them, they're going to be unimaginably hor horrifying. And then people are going to say, OK, well, we need to get them out. What's the Tories doing? Well, the Tories will be having a civil war of their own between one nation centrist conservatism, whatever that means, or uh, the right of the party, this uh, so-called popular conservatism. Um, popular conservatism certainly got the ideas, but it hasn't got the people. It hasn't got anybody credible to speak for it. it, you know, it's, it what does it say uh, that its leading lights are the ridiculous figure who is Jacob Rees-Mogg and Liz Truss, two, two of the most discredited politicians in the House of Commons. Um, I happen to agree with them on s a few things, but uh, are these seriously people who are capable of leading the nation? No. So I think we've got a political establishment in decline, a political settlement that's falling apart. Um, and a desperate yearning in the country for something new, for something better, more capable people, more capable politicians, a more honest debate. And, I, 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 and people, quite a lot of people like me on the right think uh, this, this is, this is going to burn itself out, this establishment politics eventually, and there's going to be this, uh, th this um, great collapse and then a white knight party or movement will come to the rescue. I'm afraid I'm not that optimistic. I, I think, you know, every time you think it's sunk about as low as it can possibly go, there's always one it can go further. And because of first past the post, there's no way that a, a new upstart can break through. Um, so I, I don't see any mechanism by which the old is going to be swept away. So we're going to keep on stagnated possibly for the next 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and of course, if the right of the Tory party win, loses the Tory civil war, then we're just going to get more continuity establishment politics. And so it will be, uh, you know, everyone's expecting this big explosion or implosion. But that's not how it goes. It's, it's just it's going to just be this gradual um, decay where we don't, we we don't so slow that we don't notice it, but you know the uh, the council's going bankrupt, so they'll be shutting down libraries, swimming pools because they can't afford to heat them. Uh, they're going to cut down on litter collection and pothole filling. Um, meanwhile, the bureaucracies are going to get ever more bloated and produce less all the time. And we're going to see more rats on the streets as environmental health services are, are cut down. We're going to just um, imperceptibly but gradually. You, you look at the end state, which is uh, some of the, if look at um, some of the south cities in South Africa, what they were 30 years ago and what they are now. Well, this is, uh, and, and you notice it in the weekly food shop where you see, you know, 100 pounds 20 years ago. That would fill a trolley, it would be brimming over. Uh, now you get a Tesco home delivery where you spend £100. It's about three crates and it's um, and you notice the shrinkflation and so it's, it's being squeezed every time you go to the petrol pump, every time you go to the supermarket, every time you pay your gas bill. And these are all self-inflicted. There's, you know, no reason that we should have done what we've done to farming. There's no good reason why we should have blown up all our uh, um, power stations and replaced them with useless windmills. Uh, this is purely ideological, and it's because uh, competence has left the room completely. And so I, I, I just do not see a future. But, you know, as, you know, uh, if I if I believed as Hitchens did, you know that there were places elsewhere in this world that you could go to. I'd say you know get out, but actually no. This is my country. I'm standing my ground. Uh, I've got a stake in it uh, for 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 my future. I'm, you know I'm I'm not Peter Hitchens' age. I've still got a way to run yet. This is my future, my country. I've got a stake in it, and so have my family, my niece and nephew. Um, uh, this. I, that's why I have to be active. That's why I have to speak my mind, um, because it, it's it, it's my country, and I will not allow this to happen. 
We like to think we live in a kind of free and open democracy. Uh, if we don't like our leaders, we can vote for someone else. But it feels like the, the cracks are developing now. I mean, someone gets elected on a set of promises, they don't really kind of fulfill the promises, or a person gets elected and then they're just replaced with someone who, who wasn't elected. Yeah. I mean, what do you think we can do to fix British politics? Uh, I don't know. Um, I've given this a lot of thought, and um, you know, pe uh, there's there's lots of people coming at me saying we should start a new party, as if that was an original idea. <clears throat> if you look on the right, I think there's uh, at Heritage. Uh, I think Four Britain's now defunct, but then there's uh, Britain First, and then uh, a couple of crackpot. They're they're not far right, but sort of uh, anti-vax kind of things. I don't know how many registered parties are, but um, then there's a few uh, sort of ones on the left. They never go anywhere. They're one-man bands. They don't get the traction because the one thing you need to participate in British politics or in politics anywhere in any democracy is money. Uh, and it, it, people are talking about replicating what happened with UKIP. Well, actually, UKIP uh, managed to break into the mainstream because it won uh, Euro, uh, Euro MPs. And so they had to be included on the BBC. They had to be part of the national conversation because they were an actual elected electoral force. Uh, well, we're out of the, we don't have European elections now. That's one of the downsides of Brexit is we no longer have that back door into the mainstream of politics. So it's actually a reversion to the old status quo. And so it's uh, um, the only way that any upstart party is going to get the exposure is if it's got the money. And so, of course, the one name that uh, leaps to mind is Richard Tyson has reform. OK, well, they're populists, they're broadly speaking my language, but there's no intellectual base there, there's no charisma, there's no leadership, uh, there's no strategy, so it's just a rich man's toy. And uh, it doesn't matter how much money you've got if you're wasting it, and I do believe that they will waste the money because they won't develop policy, they won't develop expertise, they won't develop competence, and you, you could elect them, uh, but it would, they would just as easily fall apart if they got elected because uh, these civil servants would ring runs, uh, run, run rings around them the exact same way they have the Tories, they, they, because they think they can just flounce into office and start issuing orders that, uh, that, that it's uh, somehow an elected dictatorship. It isn't. Everything in government is a process of negotiation and a minister has to negotiate uh, with his officials as to whether what he wants to do is uh, legal or not and what are the barriers, be it international law or existing law. OK, well, if he's identified those barriers, that minister might then spend uh, the rest of their term trying to remove those barriers. You know, Priti Patel faced this, so Ala Braverman faced this. They've got ideas of what they want to do, but they will all complain after, the, after they've been kicked out that I met all this pushback because you've got the um, ECHR rulings and various other uh, domestic laws, so you've got to spend a term removing Moving those obstacles and if you fail you're back to square one so uh, it, it, we've got a state of governmental paralysis and it's it's not until you're gonna get uh, an aggressive um, almost dictatorial power who's gonna go and say we we don't we don't care about ECHR rulings and, and you know it has been done because you know France has showed us this week you know if they want to deport uh, 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 an Islamic radical they did um, and they they did it within 24 hours but it's this uh, it's this grip that the liberal influences particularly the House of Lords we've got this curious mindset that there's this hierarchy of law where um, even though nobody living had a hand in creating this law in Britain, uh, the, 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 the ECHR and the UN, they sit at the top and they're the ultimate in uh, legitimacy for some reason. Um, and us as a subordinate country in that hierarchy have no right to get it, tell it to go and stuff itself. Well, um, we actually need uh, a government that believes in national sovereignty and its own right to govern in the national interest. Uh, but of course that means a government that's actually 
uh, this is all contingent on that government recognising what national interest is. Uh, for the moment, we've got liberal internationalists who believe it's in our national interest to splurge our money on foreign aid, on uh, you know, a space program in India, or even sending it to China, or um, uh, gay and lesbian inclusion workshops in Botswana, uh, decolonising South Africa. Well, look how well that's worked, you know. So. Um, uh, there's this cultural mismatch of what constitutes the national interest. The people thought it was in the national interest to come out of the EU and re reassert national sovereignty. Well, we did that to a point, but the, we don't have a government in London that actually wants to do anything with that sovereignty. And now, it, before it would hide behind Brussels, but now it's got the ECHR and it's got, the, oh no, we, we can't do this because we've got our international climate targets to meet and the Paris Accords. So uh, arguably there's this Brexit 2.0 brewing on, under the surface um, where it, it transpires that Brexit wasn't enough, we've actually got to go further. Part of the reason that um, Birmingham is going bankrupt is because of the, um, the equal pay uh, ruling. And uh, that is to keep us in line with uh, Europe's uh, social standards. So uh, I'm not sure if that's the withdrawal agreement or the TCA, but it, you know, it's these international instruments. So we are still, you know, a lot of Brexiteers imagine that just coming out would mean severing all the ties and we'd be free to do as we like. That was never the case. We, we've, there's, we're entangled in this lattice of international agreements, everything from WTO, UNI, ECHR, there's a dozen of these international organizations that all run these international treaties. Uh, some are respected, uh, some are obeyed, others are not. Uh, believe it or not, Pakistan is a signatory to the Treaty on Violence Against Women and Girls. Uh, uh, you know, this is ridiculous, hypocritical global construct. Um, that's where a lot on the right have started. They, they, they don't talk about the EU as such anymore. They talk about globalists and globalism and the emergence. Before we had global governance, but global governance is gradually becoming global government. And uh, our establishment sees itself as an implementing agent of those global agendas. And they've snatched our local democracy away from us, so they've amalgamated our councils, and our councils are now regional development quangos that exist purely to implement net zero. And if you complain loudly enough, they might come and empty your bins and fill a pothole every now and then. But the idea of local government being accountable and local, you know, my local council is now governing an area larger than Luxembourg and larger than 100 countries in the UN, and this is supposedly local government. If I wanted to go to the seat of my local government, I'd have to drive for an hour. This is not local government. It's no longer, we don't, we talk about democracy. We have these voting rituals, but the, the, these, these entities are not in any way answerable to us. All the things that they've imposed, low traffic neighborhoods, ULEs, these are, thing, this is, these are things that are done to us, and we don't have a veto in it, and we can vote for people to get rid of it, but, oh no, we've got to meet these targets, so these, these are the instruments to uh, implement net zero, so this is what we're doing. So the idea that the people are in control I is a joke. So if, you, if there's, uh, uh, you know, the word democracy means people power, demos kratos. If the people themselves do not have power, then you ain't a democracy, simple as. I wanted to explore the climate issues with you a bit more. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we look at Germany now, they're bringing back these coal-fired power mm -hmm. stations, very efficient coal-fired power stations. I mean, we abandoned coal, we kind of abandoned nuclear as well. Yep. It feels like we're in a, a mess of our own making, really. I mean, how do we Indeed. get into this mess? Well, it starts with the European uh, Large Combustion Plant Directive, which um, uh, initially was to deal with acid rain because of the sulphur content in British coal and European coal. And uh, I, I, it's arguable as to whether that obviously was an issue. Um, but 
they set about basically demolishing all of our coal stations because they believed that uh, we could harness the power of wind. And superficially, on a very superficial level, it makes sense. You know, North Sea, lots of wind out there, and if we can capture it, it's free energy. But um, the reality of the situation has proved somewhat different. It's, uh, it's actually a very expensive and inefficient way uh, to, to supply energy because the grid was never designed for diffuse and intermittent sources of energy. If you, uh, if you drive across the M62, uh, sort of eastbound, you'll see Ferry Bridge, Drax, and I think Egborough. Uh, uh, they, two of those, two of the three, I think, have been completely demolished. Um, but that was um, central to the northern power grid and they were knocking out a constant amount of energy. That was your base load. And the grid was designed for that method. But you knock those out, and then you've got your sources of energy being windmills out on the tops of the Pennines and out at sea, going up and down all the time. They've got to be balanced with conventional gas stations. And um, there are times when the entire fleet drops to absolute zero, so you've got to ramp all your gas up. And I can speak at length, I can bore you at length on this. Uh, it's a fascinating subject if you want to climb into it. Um, but uh, balancing a grid is a very tricky and very expensive business. And um, this idea that uh, we could completely com uh, replace conventional baseload generation with windmills is just for the birds. And we're finding now it's getting more and more expensive to keep the lights on. And that's, you know, that's why we're becoming less competitive. This is, it, we've, um, we've put, People say that wind is cheaper than gas, but when you when you consider a third of what we pay on the gas, that's the fuel for uh, combined cycle gas turbines, a third of that is green taxes. So if you take away the deliberate market distortions, uh, wind is actually ch uh, more expensive than gas. So you know this, uh, the focus should be on cheap, affordable energy to stimulate the British economy, but no environmentalist dogma comes in. And uh, people say, oh, well, don't you care about the environment? Well, you know, for every fraction of emissions that we reduce, we're seeing more uh, on the uh, Indian and Chinese side as they're ramping up their use of coal to record levels. They don't care about these uh, international treaty, uh, treaties on climate. Uh, they pay lip service to it, and then they flood the European market with uh, cheap slave-produced uh, solar panels and uh, uh, turbine blades that we can't recycle. There's nothing green about this, uh, not least since uh, the World Economic Forum uh, a little while produced a piece. The figures it referenced said net zero would require a 900 times expansion in global mineral mining. So you're transitioning from a fossil fuel intensive economy to a mineral intensive economy, which involves seabed strip mining, um, which doesn't do much for habitats last time I checked. And then uh, the cobalt and mines of the Congo that employ slave labor. If you've seen the footage, it's horrifying. You cannot actually believe that in this century uh, that, 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 that this still goes on, and yet it does on a massive scale. And this is what they're proposing to expand right across Africa. And when you find these big mineral contracts, you find a lot of corruption and local uh, governments who are more, more beholden to the mineral mining companies than they are their own taxpayers, to the extent where they don't even bother to run a domestic tax base because it, it recovers a pittance. So there's no sense of civic buy-in, no sense of civil society, and consequently no democracy. And that's why you go to any sort of Central African country, the rubbish disposal goes straight in the rivers, uh, there's no rubbish collection, there's no civic administration, it's all completely corrupt because the government can buy its arms and its weapons and its uh, uh, brand new Mercedes with contracts it gets for, for mining. This is what destabilizes Africa. This is what causes your famines. This is what causes your wave after wave after wave of migration. And then they're all dying in the Mediterranean. And this is your great green economy. It, they, you know, the green economy people, their hands are absolutely dripping with blood. 
And if we look at you know the ULES cameras and people are, are chopping them down, do you think we're going to see more of you know people pushing back when their actual living standards are affected by these crazy green policies? Uh, to a point, uh, you, you can they're, they're going to keep destabilising uh, ULES and knocking down the cameras, but the pushback by government is going to get a damn sight more aggressive. And uh, it's, it's easy to organise that kind of resistance in London, but not so difficult, uh, not so easy in other parts of the country. Um, uh, and you're going to see uh, more and more use of private bailiffs who are going to, and they're go, we're going to, it's, it's going to turn into a surveillance state now because they're going to be uh, fines for everything. Uh, LTNs turned down the wrong street, £30 fine. Uh, cross a bus lane that you didn't know was there yesterday, £30 fine. Don't pay it within two weeks, we'll double it. And don't pay it within a month, or we'll send the, uh, the council will send the heavy boys, which will be private companies of uh, bailiffs to bash on people's doors and they'll be completely lawless and uh, people won't um, people won't dare stand up to them uh, because these companies themselves are corrupt they're self-regulated and if if you call the police to say they're here the police will come out and side with them uh, so it's going to get a lot more toxic and a lot more unpleasant um, and so how does that pushback manifest? Yeah, the anti ULES cameras, we'll see a lot of that. Um, but I, th I think it's going to go beyond that. And I think it's going to get a lot more dangerous. Uh, and I, I can't say exactly how it is going to uh, manifest. But I think um, the police are certainly going to find that they have uh, less public support as they become state enforcers. And it's going to be a us versus them kind of thing. And um, this is this is against the Pelian principles, where the the police are the public and the public are the police, and it's a collaborative role in society they play. They then become the sort of iron wall between us and the establishment that is raiding our wallets, destroying our wealth, eroding our freedoms, and it will eventually come to riots on the streets, where police themselves will have to decide whose side they're on. Pete Noll, thanks for joining us. Pleasure.